Good morning. So good to see everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Uh, so happy that you're here today. Um, we're going to worship here in a minute. Uh, we're going to sing Nothing But the Blood. It's one of my favorite hymns. Um, what can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. So let's stand as we worship together. What can wash? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. great to see you here this morning. I hope you had a good week and whatever the status you have in life now, I pray that you'll be encouraged by the things that are said and sung uh, this morning. If you're a guest with us, uh, there's a card in front of you. If you fill that out, put it in one of the boxes as you exit. I'll send you a note and thank you for coming. And then also if you have a prayer request, you can put that on there also. That's our way of trying to communicate with one another. We're really glad that you're here. Uh, take a moment and let those near you know that you're glad to see them today at First Baptist Church. Go. Mother Church. 
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. 
invitation this morning. Build our lives around the love, the bloodshed. Sing it out.
Just uh, thank you that uh, the death was arrested, it was defeated, it was eradicated. And, and uh, Lord, we, uh, you are a chain breaker. You, uh, you free us from, from sin. Uh, nothing but the blood can do that, Father. Uh, we love you and we praise you. In your name I pray. Amen. This week I was looking at... Uh, uh, I've got a small library in my study, and I was looking at some of the books, and one of the books is titled, God Wants You to Win. And I thought, okay, well, it's kind of, I've got books I hadn't read. Everybody does, I'm just honest about it. But uh, anyway, and so I looked at some of the titles in there, and I believe God wants us to win in the sense that he wants us to be uh, victorious and living for him, but I don't believe God wants us to win in the sense that a lot of people judge winning in our world today. Uh, it always amazes me when teams play in sports. They both pray ahead of time, but oh, somebody always loses. I think the most honest prayer I ever heard before a ball game, they said Scott Hill decades ago when OU was playing Nebraska, he led the team prayer beforehand and said, please God, don't let the best team win. And uh, so, so uh, honest anyway. This morning we're looking at the second of seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 that are representative of churches throughout all of time. They were real churches in the first century. Uh, they're not just randomly selected, but they have different strengths and weaknesses. And the church in Smyrna that we're going to look at today has no weaknesses listed by Jesus when he has this message sent to them uh, by John the Apostle. There's no weaknesses mentioned and yet, from the world's vantage point, if they were in America today, we would say that they are not, they're not winners because they were having major struggles. They were in a place where it was not going well. And yet, in the estimation of Jesus, he says that they were a very rich church. I titled this sermon, Smyrna, the Rich Church, and I should have put rich in parentheses because they were actually impoverished. And yet, in the eyes of Jesus, they were very rich. All you really need to know about Smyrna, as far as then, uh, it was a large city in what is current-day Turkey. Uh, it was uh, planned out. It was a very beautiful city. Uh, there were about a half a million people there. And the two things of main concern to us is it, was a, it had chosen to be a center of emperor worship. 
like they worshipped Caesar. They had a temple built there. They, appealed, he, they sought to have that there, and it was a reality in the city. And so once a year, everybody who was a citizen of the city would go in to the temple that was built to the emperor of Rome, and they would offer a pinch of incense, and they would say, Caesar is Lord. No big deal unless you're a Christian, and only Jesus is Lord. So then that causes a problem, and they're not willing to do that, and so they receive persecution for that. Also, there was a large segment of, of Jews that lived there in Smyrna, and they disagreed with the Christian conclusion about who Jesus Christ really was. They didn't accept him as Messiah, and so they pressured the Christians as well. And so there's a lot of other things that could be said, but that's plenty to know, is just that they have major parts of the city that they live in and where the church is stationed that are coming against them. So beginning in verse 8 of chapter 2 in Revelation, Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking to John the Apostle. And he says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Jesus rewarded the church in Smyrna, for overcoming challenges, and still today, Jesus rewards churches uh, for overcoming challenges. And what we can say about a church, we could also say about individual Christians, because a church is made up, it's not about a building, it's about those who make it up, the individual members. And the realities that we see in these four verses are not, God wants you to win. The realities we see in these verses are that churches will face challenges. Uh, challenges may get worse. Jesus will remain faithful. And the reality is true for you individually that Christians uh, will face challenges. Uh, challenges may get worse. Jesus will remain faithful. First of all, we see that churches will face challenges. George Bryan told me that several years ago, back when Leonard Malone was a pastor here, that the church was going through some challenging financial times. He was on the stewardship committee, and after they had had one especially uh, eventful meeting, he said that Leonard Malone looked at George and said, isn't church work fun? <laughs> and, uh, and, and so usually it is, but there are times when there are challenges that are a part of what a church faces in this world, just like there are challenges that are a part of what you face in your life. Uh, churches will face challenges from the devil. It says in verse 9 that Jesus says that he refers to Satan, and then in verse 10 he refers to the devil, uh, that these are assaults that are not just randomly by people that don't like people that are in the church, but organized by Satan himself, by the devil himself. Jesus defeated Satan on the cross when he died, paid for our sins completely, came out of the grave. That was the end of Satan as far as his final destiny. One day he'll be chained and thrown into the lake of fire forever. If you read the rest of the book of Revelation, it tells us that. But in the here and now, he actively opposes every follower of Jesus Christ. Every church is from the devil. We're in a spiritual conflict. Uh, he's, he is a murderer. He seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a liar. He always has been. That's what Jesus said he was. And so you have a murderer and a liar that's on the loose and seeking to destroy. And even though one day he's completely defeated in the here and now, he opposes the church. He opposes Christians. That's, it's from the devil. That's where it comes from. And he doesn't quit. And that's why it's so frustrating that many who follow Jesus Christ quit for whatever reason. I'm not questioning anybody's salvation. I'm just saying that along the way, for whatever reason, Christians don't seem to be near as resilient as the devil himself. And he's defeated. Eventually, he's not going to make it. He'll just roll over and die now, but he won't. He keeps on keeping on. And so churches will face challenges from the devil through the world. 
The world in which we live, it was true then, it's true now, that the world applies various challenges. It mentions three things. Jesus mentions three things uh, in Smyrna that they face. They face tribulation, poverty, and slander. Tribulation. That word was used to refer to, it was used of a millstones that ground wheat into flour. So applying intense pressure. It was used of crushing grapes to make wine. And so it was crushing, it was pressure, it was tribulation. And that's what they felt. They felt that from those, he says, the synagogue of Satan, those who are opposing you and don't believe what you believe, that they, they do these things to you, they put pressure on you. And even though in our world today, we don't have the pressure like they had at that time, there's still pressure. There's pressure to conform. The world puts pre- the word persecution is used to conform to a mold. The world's always trying to conform you to believe like it believes, live like it lives, accept its values as your values. It's all around us, and it's getting worse as far as the world in which we live. They don't want, you know, we are a, a land of religious liberty, and I'm thankful for it. I think we need to pray that we have religious liberty and social peace. That tells us that in the scriptures. Uh, but now it's not enough to have liberty. It's like you got to believe and accept and promote who I am and what I do, or you're a bigot. Well, that's not true. We don't believe. The Bible doesn't allow us to believe everything that everybody believes. And when you take that stand more and more, I sense it. I would th- assume you do too, that there is this pressure to give up your stand on the Word of God and kind of just cave into other things. That's what Smyrna was feeling. But they didn't give in. Tribulation, poverty, they had because of, first of all, they started out, many of the first century Christians were slaves to start with, so they didn't have much, but they didn't get promoted. They didn't have opportunities to excel because of the way they would not practice emperor worship. They would not conform to what the world wanted to do, and so they end up and they did without a lot of things. They were impoverished. They, they didn't have things. And yet Jesus says, but you are rich. The way I measure things is not by how much money you have in your bank account. I measure your character and your stand. And in my estimation, you are rich. So they face tribulation. They they face uh, poverty. And then also it mentions slander. That they were killed with words by the things that other people would say. Things they accused them of various things. They accused them of being cannibalistic. I mean, you think about it. They drank the blood and ate the body of Christ. And so then that spreads, and just like any gossip, it just gets bigger and bigger. They were were accused of being immoral because they had these agape feasts, these love feasts before when they celebrated their love for one another and their love for Christ, and then they had the Lord's Supper together. Uh, Just like in any situation, things that are said can get out of control. And so they faced slander. So Christians will face challenges ultimately from the devil, through the world, in varying degrees. It's not always the same amount of pressure. I was uh, with, uh, Nancy and I were with Kendall and Barbara Johnson a week or two ago, and they were laughing and talking about when they had middle school boys that he was teaching. Uh, They came over to the house one time for a fellowship, and they found the shock collar that Kendall used to keep his bird dog in line. And as middle school students sometimes do with their non-formed brains, they decided it would be a good idea to try that on one another. And uh, Kendall said, okay, you can do that, but you don't, don't put it over a three. Now, I don't know if they all obeyed that or not. Why do you don't want to put it over a three? Because there's different degrees. You put it all the way up to ten, you gotta, you're going to really get, get some action. So in the tribulation or the, the challenges that churches face, it's in varying degrees. But it's still tribulation. It's still a challenge. Don't feel guilty that you're not in a place where you're, where you're not persecuted more, if that makes sense. You are where you are by God's design. And if you're honest, you feel pressure. You are slandered. You, are, you do miss out on some things because of your stand for Christ. And the, the call to follow Jesus is the call to experience challenges 
the reality we see here is, no, God doesn't necessarily want you to be a winner in the eyes of the world. God wants you to be faithful, and sometimes that means you're going to face some challenges. Sometimes that means the church is going to face challenges. Uh, the church will face challenges. Secondly, challenges may get worse. Um, he says here that not only are they being suffering persecution, and he says in verse 10, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. It's bad now, but it's about to get worse. And so also for churches and for individual Christians, challenges may uh, get worse as allowed by God. The reason that Jesus is able to tell them what's about to happen is because he's about to allow it to happen. He knows, what, he knows the future, and he's going to allow it to happen. And if he doesn't allow it to happen, it wouldn't happen. So he's, he's going to allow it to occur. It tells us in the New Testament over and over again that he allows challenging times that we may be more fruitful. We may be more like Jesus, that we may be... He says in John 15 that those of you who bear fruit, he prunes you that you might bear more fruit. I had a brother-in-law one time who just, he's a, runs a landscaping deal in Manhattan, Kansas. And he was down here and he was trimming these bushes like he was a madman in our yard. And he, he, said, uh, he said, you'll thank me next year. You just got to, you know, I heard someone say you, you need to let somebody that, that has no connection to you personally trim your peach trees. Because it needs to be done Radically. And when God allows, you know, God allows uh, challenges to get worse, He allows it so we may be more fruitful. We may be more Christ like. I wish it were true that all of us could just learn if God made us healthy and wealthy and wonderful. But the reality is that you have become who you are. I've become who I am. This church has become who it is, what it is. Not through all the good times but through the challenges that make us more and more like Jesus. And so, as allowed by God, life is as God allows. This is not a dualistic world where the devil and God are hooking it up, you know, hooking it out and seeing who's in control. This world is a monarchy under the God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the one who's in absolute control. And... As allowed by God, uh, challenges may get worse. As limited by God. He says in verse 10, And for ten days you will have tribulation. That is, there's a limit to it. It's not an open-ended thing. That's, there's a plan for it, and there's a purpose for it, and that purpose will be fulfilled, but it's limited. It's not going to take any more time than is necessary. It says in First Peter that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour which he is, but he's on God's chain. The book of Job, the best, some, that's just a great book, kind of depressing book, but it's a great book. But at the beginning, the devil is not able to do anything to Job that God doesn't allow him to do. Same way with you. There's nothing that's going to cross your path that's not allowed by God. He limits what can happen. Uh, my male Brittany dog, Duke, barks at everybody. I guess I need to get a shock collar and just put the whammy on him. Uh, to, I don't think you'd learn. He's just, that's in his DNA. But he's on a leash. So like when I see friends, when I'm walking, uh, he barks at them. His bark's worse than his bite, but he's on my leash. So he never has hurt anybody. He's not going to hurt anybody. It's just embarrassing. You see Brian and Kim Cook this morning. How's it going? <laughs> Good grief. Uh, so anyway, so, but he's on the leash. He, he's not going to hurt anybody because he's, he's on the leash of his master. Anything that happens in our life is allowed by God, is limited by God. So the church in Smyrna was going to go into the time of tribulation, but for 10 days, for a limited amount of time, symbolic of a limited amount of time. And so the world then and the world today is still under the control of God. One day there will be an end to all suffering. Um, more than likely that's going to be an eternity. But it'll end, and God's got a plan, and He's working that plan. So the realities we see here, not the, the reality we see is, does God want you to be a winner? Well, define win. He wants you to become more like Christ, but as far as not ever having any trouble and always coming out on top, that isn't what He says here. He says, 
churches and Christians uh, will face challenges. Challenges may become worse than finally Jesus will remain faithful. That's the reality through all of this. Charles Spurgeon said, Though you have changed a thousand times, Jesus has not changed once. I read again, this came up in my reading in Hebrews. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he will remain faithful uh, to his people. He does so as our sovereign Lord. When Jesus identifies himself in verse 8, he says to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, the words of the first and the last. I've always been, I will always be. I created everything, I'll be here when the end of everything occurs. I'm the first and the last. Who died and came to life. I conquered the greatest enemy in all of humanity, that is physical death. I died and I came back to life. That's what I want you to know is that I'm, I'm sovereign Lord. I'm in charge. And what a great comfort it was to this church that was suffering, this church that was persecuted, this church that was going through hard times, this impoverished, slandered, crushed, pressured church. And he's saying, I'm the first and the last. I, I was dead. I'm alive. You remember, as your sovereign Lord, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to remain faithful. A couple of weeks ago when the rain started, uh, one evening after a big, pretty big shower, Nancy caught a glimpse of a rainbow outside one of our windows, and we both ran outside to see it. I remember I even got my socks wet. I didn't, it was so excited it finally rained, I didn't even take my socks off. Uh, so I'm out there, and it was huge. I don't know if you saw it or not, but it was in the eastern sky, and you could see the whole thing from, the, from all the way over. And my first thought was, God is large and in charge. He is still in control, and it's... it's you know, after the worst storm of all time in the days of Noah, God sets the rainbow there, and it's his reminder, no more will it be destroyed by water. The world's not going to be destroyed by water. I'm faithful. I'll provide for you. I'll take care of you. And I had a hallelujah moment out there just looking at the rainbow in the east and remembering that God's still in control. God, Jesus will remain faithful as our sovereign Lord, as our empathetic shepherd. He says in verse 9, I know your tribulation, your poverty, your slander. And the word know there doesn't just mean to know about it. It's not like he's in heaven watching and monitoring the situation on security cameras. It's, I know empathetically. I know what you're going through because I went through it myself. I know what it's like to be in tribulation and pressured and crushed. He was crushed for our sins and our iniquities. He knows what it's like to be, go through tribulation. He, he knows what it's like to be impoverished. Lived 33 years in this world, and when he died on the cross, the only thing he had of any worth was one seamless robe that they gambled for. He knew what it was like to not have a place to lay his head. He knew what it was like to be slandered. People said stuff about him that wasn't true up until the time that he died. People that knew better, but just kept on saying things that weren't true. So he's saying, when you're going through hard times and you feel like you can't go on, I know what you're going through. I am your empathetic shepherd. It says in Hebrews that we do not have a great high priest who cannot empathize with our weaknesses, but he was tempted to sin in every way like we are, and yet he was without sin, so he knows what you're going through. He understands the hurt. He, know, he understands the frustrations. He understands every bit of it and so yes challenges are going to happen in life and they may even get worse probably will but Jesus remains faithful as our sovereign Lord as our empathetic shepherd and as our omnipotent encourager he says to the church in Smyrna you are rich Jesus says I think higher of you than others think of you. I think higher of you than you even think of yourself. You're rich. You're doing well. He encourages them. In the same way he encourages us as we live day by day. He continues to encourage us as he remains faithful even when life gets tough and gets tougher. He will help us. In verse 10 he says, do not fear. Then he says, be faithful until death. Those are high expectations. 
that you wouldn't be afraid when life gets hard, that you're faithful unto death. How does that happen? It happens because He helps us. He stands up inside of us. He gives us strength. He carries us and allows us to go forward. That same Hebrews 13, 8, I said Jesus is Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 9 there says it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods that you eat, not by some newfangled way of trying to do things. There's not a new and improved way of living a Christian life. How, how are we strengthened? By the grace of God. You are saved by the undeserved favor of God, and so also you're helped day by day by the undeserved favor of God. He is the omnipotent encourager. He helps us. And then also he rewards us. He says in verse 10, it says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life there is not a ruling crown that give you a crick in your neck. It was like, it's like a crown of olive leaves that was the victor's crown. They would give you something if you want to, want to race. Think standing on the podium. Think being faithful and training all this time and you're victorious and you're joyful. That's what he's referring to here. And not only that, but also he says, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. We are qualified for eternity through faith in Jesus Christ. There really is a second death. Read the rest of the book of Revelation. There's a lake of fire where the devil's going one time. All those who don't believe in Jesus are going there too. But he says it doesn't affect you because of your relationship with me and you don't need to be afraid. You'll conquer that. You'll be rewarded with eternal life. But also, I'd like to just point out the crown of life, the crown which is life, abundant life, joyful life, courageous life, you as a Christian, if you know Christ as Savior, can live that kind of winning life, if you will. But it comes when you allow Jesus to take control of your life and you walk with him day by day. And you can have, even in the midst of challenges that get worse, you can have joy that never ends. You can have peace that passes all understanding. You can have courage to stand firm no matter what. He gives you the crown of life because he says... If you are faithful unto death, continue to follow me, continue to remain faithful to me, and I will reward you with this life of abundance. I was walking Wednesday. My dogs, I tried to, I tried to get my walk in in the morning between showers, and I almost did. <sighs> Made it almost home. And it starts lightning, and it's like, God, if you'll just let me get home, I won't do this again. I'm sorry, I'm stupid. Um, it, but it reminded me of about five years ago. It was kind of like, kind of like it's been here. It was dry all summer or, or all spring when it wasn't supposed to be dry. And Nancy and I were walking. Uh, my our dog Freckles, the, the female Brittany I have, and. Uh, she wasn't very old. She's just a pup. So it was about five years ago. And we walked, and we didn't think it was going to rain because it hadn't rained in three months or whatever, you know. So, But by the time we got up by the high school, it turned black, and it just the bottom fell out. And I don't remember how we got in there. We didn't break, it wasn't breaking and entering, but the doors were open to the cafeteria. It wasn't, school wasn't going on, but it was... It was so we're, we're standing in the cafeteria, and the water is just coming down, coming down, coming down. And we're there, and I'm holding the dog. Nancy's standing there. We read all about it, all the championships and all the stuff that's in there in the room. We're reading all this and just thinking, the storm's going to be, if the, when the storm gets over, we're going to go home. When the storm's going to, when it gets over, we'll go home. And it just kept raining. Nancy had her phone. She called Riley Payne. And Riley and Barbara were probably just finishing up drinking coffee at Carl's Jr., if I was guessing. I don't know what they were doing. Anyway, but he said, yes, sure, we'll come and pick you up. And so they pulled up to the front of the cafeteria. We make a da dash for it, and we got in their Subaru, and we made it home in the middle of the storm because the storm never would quit. Here's what I want to remind you this morning from the, from the church at Smyrna. 
The storm may never quit. But you're still going to make it home. And all you need to do is ask your best friend, Jesus, to help you get there. Let's stand for prayer. Jesus, thank you that you remain faithful to be with us through everything that we face in life. Thank you for being real and honest through your word, not telling us something that doesn't go along with how life really is, but then in the midst of challenges that sometimes grow worse, you remain faithful. We love you more than we ever have because of the way that you stand by us and you help us moment by moment, day by day. There are some people here this morning who are going through some huge challenges. Remind them that you're with them and for them. There are some here that they've never called out on you. They're in the middle of a storm. They just don't know how to get home and they don't know who to call. That they would cry out to you in faith this morning and accept Jesus as their Savior. We thank you for the hope we have because of what you've done for us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. I'll be here at the front if I can help you in any way as we sing our final song.
to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Just voices. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Thank you so much for joining us. A few things before we dismiss. First, we are having the Lord's Supper on June 26 during both services, so be in prayer for that. Also, that evening at 6 o'clock in the worship center, we'll be having a Falls Creek parent meeting, so we want you to be there. We also ask that you be in prayer for our mission team that will, is preparing to leave for South Padre on June 19th. Finally, we would like to remind you and invite you to our church fellowship at Raider Park on June 29th at 6 p.m. We ask that if you would like to bring some ice cream, please contact the church office and let them know. Church, as you go, remember to abide in Christ, proclaim the gospel, build the church, and go make disciples. You are dismissed. <laughs>